Uh, we've taken students to Haiti, to Panama, many times to Jamaica, and, um, and it's really enriched the experience of students as well as ourselves as teachers. So I say that to say that when we applied for this Fulbright grant, um, it was based on a philosophy of Pan-Africanism and a philosophy of African-centered learning and teaching that focuses on immersion as the deepest way to learn. Uh, we applied for two years and we were turned down. And um, I like a struggle and a challenge, so we applied a third time. Well, uh, in the meantime, I got some real insight from people about, about what it is that we needed to focus on. And one of the areas to focus on uh, is Brazil. And Brazil is, a, is, a, is a, 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 a country that the United States government is very interested in, um, probably for the wrong reasons, but uh, most definitely because Brazil is this growing economic powerhouse. Um, and so we focused our efforts on Brazil, and in doing so, I said, well, I really need to meet the right person that can really help set up a curriculum in Brazil. Uh, and so uh, the ancestors brought forth a sister friend, um, Ashe Latel. If you could stand, please. And Ashe uh, does work around sex trafficking here uh, with youth, and we had her students and our students work together for, for a semester, and it became uh, very apparent to me that she really knew Brazil very well, especially Bahia. And so she and I worked together to make this possible along with the other people that are already thanked. Um, so the effort, uh, the, the major deliverables, I guess, of the grant were for us to, uh, to select high school educators and college university educators from ethnic studies uh, primarily or disciplines that are very related to ethnic studies and who already teach from a cultural uh, frame of reference. And that uh, we would have three phases, that there would be a, a pre-travel phase, phase where we would be introduced to Brazilian Portuguese language uh, where we would do a lot of reading and dialoguing and training um, about, you know, about Brazil and about the, <coughs> the African-centered way and just all these pieces. The second phase would be to go to Bahia, Brazil for 30 days and um, engage as deeply as possible with activists, organizers, people of culture, houses of Congoble, you know, just all of these pieces to, uh, to deepen our project. Uh, which ultimately uh, is to produce curriculum. And the high school faculty produced five different units with several lessons within those units. Uh, this was a lot of work. And if you pull them aside, they'll say, oh my god, that was a lot of work. Um, you don't have to pull them aside, just ask them. We worked and worked and worked and worked. It was very rigorous. This was not a vacation. We worked and worked and worked and were pushed and worked and were tired and complained and worked and pushed. But at the end of the day, what we have produced is brilliant. And I really, really am grateful to all the participants with all the difficulty and struggle of all the work that what we have put together collectively is amazing. And, um, and it gets us to the third phase of the project, which is to make this curriculum available to everyone and anyone. And so we emailed it across the state of California. We made it available on the website where anyone can come and push and click and download and read and use it in their community organizations or use it for their own personal knowledge or use it in the classroom. Because at the end of the day, this project is really about our students. We got to go, we've been transformed. But that transformation was to go to our students. Because if year after year, hundreds of students come before us. And the more we can teach from a clear African-centered perspective and teach about our people, the more we're empowering the young people that sit in front of us. So that's basically what the project is about. And um, I have to say that this project would not near have reached the level or depth or clarity that it did without our advisors. Our senior advisor to the project is uh, Dr. Wade Nobles, if he could stand. <laughs> and equally important, Dr. Linda James Myers from The Ohio State University served as advisor. <laughs> and although a participant, she is also an advisor and elder on our trip uh, Dr. Mama Vera Nobles, who's right here. I, I, I don't know, 
you know, if you've read their works and talked to them and know them, I know many of you in here have, but there's, there's absolutely no way this project would have been what it has become without their input. They pushed us, they challenged us, they angered us sometimes by saying, rethink this, redo this. And we're like, I'm done, I just want to be done. No, you're not done. And the ability to spend that much time with these wise people and dialogue and hang out was, was invaluable. I will be forever grateful. Um, they pushed me, you know, they pushed the whole entire project. And so it was really a gift to have this kind of knowledge with us on a day-to-day -day basis for 30 days, you know, and an honor as a student who studied the works and been in the classrooms of Dr. Wade Nobles and um, Dr. Linda James Myers and uh, Mama Dr. Vera Nobles. So I'm gonna turn it over to them to talk about uh, what they produced. Um, a lot of this unfolded as we went. Uh, Dr. Nobles um, had the idea, you know, let's have an, uh, an introduction to the entire project so that people can understand what do we mean when we're talking about an African-centered way. Because if teachers who have not been immersed in this kind of thinking just click on and just grab a lecture that Brother Fahim created or a lecture that Brother Greg created, they may not really understand it unless they are seeing it from the perspective of which we want them to see it. And so they, uh, uh, Dr. Myers and Dr. Nobles created an amazing introduction and introductory PowerPoint so that educators can go through that first and then go to the curriculum so that they will gain more insight from the curriculum. And so um, please welcome Dr. Wade Nobles uh, to talk to us about the introduction and followed by Dr. Linda James Myers. Give you an introduction with more an observation and a reflection of experience. Because um, we did do something that hadn't been done before. And what we did was we, we refined and made more formal the African-centered way. Mm -hmm. All of us who are in African studies or in ethnic studies, we, 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 we be African, we do African. But then to sit down and say, how do you define this particular aspect? How do you in, embed this in a curriculum was a formal exercise. And that formal exercise was very much like, and I, 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 I used to say this to my students and didn't really ever experience it, but it was like building a jet plane and flying across the country at the same time. And this was that experience. Because we were in Brazil and we were dealing with uh, this Fulbright project and some of us were political, said so Fulbright and the CIA, some of us maybe mixed up together, we don't know. And, and what, why they want to particularly know about Africa, Brazil. So we, we had that conscious in, in, in the back of our minds, but we were given an assignment to develop this, these curriculum and these lesson plans. And in that process, we had to literally operationally define our terminology. And, and the big part of, the, of this project was this idea of, uh, of culture as power. And there are two terms there that we just live with, but we never really defined. One was culture. What does it really mean? It's not just song and dance. And what was power? And what does it mean? It's not just being able to beat up on somebody. And so we had to figure out intellectually, as we dialogue with each other, these two sort of hit linchpins in this process. And we, we, we came up with some definitions that are in the materials. And, 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 and I won't really go through those, those with you, because you, I want to encourage you to go to the website and read those materials. But the question of power, the question of culture, the question of history, the question of politics. Those became issues that we had to do as an introduction. Clearly the history question was an important one because history is a story. And it's a story that reflects and represents a people's experience of moments and movements. And there was a moment where all of us were on a ship and some got dropped off in Brazil. Same folk went on and got dropped off in the Caribbean. Same <laughs> folks went on and got dropped off in the uh, United States. So we got this moments and movements that made us believe that these Afro-Brazilians and Afro-Caribbeans and Afro-Americans are different people. When us, we're not different people, we had different bus stops. And so, and so we need to look at that and, and, and talk about that in terms of history. And the politics became an important one because Afro-Brazil, Brazil is a critical place politically. It's a critical place that, that if it's not handled well, in my opinion, it will be usurped by the politics that are not conducive to Afro-Brazilian or African life anywhere. But clearly the politics deals with acquiring resources. That's what most people talk about as politics. How do you acquire resources? 
But you know, there's some folks that said being quiet by just stealing it and beating you up and taking it. You know those folks out there. But the other part of that politics is the fact that politics has to do with how do you attain and reinforce your meaning of being. That's a political question. And, and so the part of our study in Brazil was to look at how our first stop, first bus stop people uh, did this question of attaining the meaning of being human, the meaning of being African. That's sort of the, 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 the introduction. And then I looked at the, the observation. The observation for me was, was critical because I think I mentioned in Brazil that, that nowadays people, I walk around and people sort of nod to me as being an elder. And I'm not sure that cloth fits me yet. The, the, the suit of eldership. The, the suit of eldership is still so uncomfortable. I'm wearing my daddy's coat. I'm not sure that it really fits me right. So, so, so I was concerned about this eldership, and I tried to share with folk that you know we just folk, we just people. But you know I may have three or four days ahead of you in my walk of life, and so I may have some insights that I can share with you. But they are insights. And what what they, what uh, uh, Linda and, and Vera and I all did was said. Here's some observation for you to consider. Uh, they may have taken it, as, as Siri said, as, you know, you don't do that, go do that. We weren't doing it that way. We really were saying, you know, you're not really stupid, but here's something you might think about. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and, and, and that was a good, I want, I want to share with you, that was a good dialogue because as family, that's what folks do. Right. Old folks say, child, if I was you, I would think about it this way. They don't say, damn it, go do it. Now they do because we get all crazy. But, but, but in, the old days, in the old days, we said, child, if I was you, I'd think about this. And that's the kind of dialogue we had in, in, uh, in, in Brazil. I told Siri that, you know, that you know, Vera's the, 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 the fellow, I'm going to be her helper. I'm just going there to hang out. I'm just going to hang out. I'm going to be out at the beach. I'm in the clubs. <laughs> but I didn't see the beach but two times. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 but it, it was something I was disappointed with because the real beauty of Brazil was in you all. It was in the fellows that were there and, and seeing and, and me being able to recognize that this African family is so deep and so strong and so real that it reinforced that there was no all these differences. There was this folk there that knew who we were and we knew who they were. That observation became important because it allowed us to then struggle with the technical stuff. How do you clarify the notion of an African city? Right? I heard uh, a series several times uh, say, uh, just do what you know, you do what you do. And that's sort of unfortunate because folks say, I'm in the classroom, but I don't think about what I'm doing, I just do it. How is that African-centered way? So we had to make explicit the African-centered way. And we talked about it, and Linda and I tried to put some language on paper that represents that African-centered way, and you can look at that. We also had to define what is African studies, because while we talk about ethnic studies, you know, there really is no ethnic, there's just, there are Asians, there are Africans, there are Brazilian. This ethnic thing is, is, a, is, is something else. It's a whole other lecture. Uh, but we did that. We had to talk about these issues about how do Africans, particularly Afro-Brazilians, uh, understand their humanity? How do they recognize their humanity? And I want to stop there with that. That's an important question. Because yeah. I can take it back to West Oakland. I can take it back to East Oakland. How do Africans understand and recognize their humanity? Not what television says, not what their teachers say, but how do we as a people understand what it means to be human? And we struggled with that for 30 days, and we struggled with that, and, and, and we're still, I think, we're still reflecting on it. I think that I, I reflected on myself as, as I was an advisor, but I really was a student, because I was learning and getting breakthroughs and intellectual insights, but dialogue with, with the folk there that I hadn't thought about before I came to, uh, to Brazil. We also had to deal with how do you make sense out of reality. That gets us into this whole question of, of the grand narrative, and, and, and whose voice, and what epistemological reflections. See all that language now? We just out in Brazil. We just say, I'm, I'm, I go, I'm at Berkeley High. I'm just doing my teaching. I ain't with my. No, you maybe talk about your epistemological reflection, but this is not what I signed up for almost. We, but we went through those issues and dealt with those. And then finally, how do, we, how do we give voice that is an African voice to the curriculum? So we could just wrote curriculum. We, could, we, you know, we know all the pieces of curriculum that's going to. We could have did that and, and went away and spent time on the beach. But we had to capture the African voice. And that's a very important thing because that voice reflects our essence. And what's that F essence, what's the African essence as expressed in, in Brazil? What's the African essence expressed in Guinea, West Oakland? What's the African expressed in, in I was in Norway, in Norway? So we look at those things. You all need a microphone? It's just the sound is kind of distorted once it gets to the back. That's, that's damn, you give me a microphone, I think I'm. 
<laughs> and so we, so we really tried to say, look what happens, I do this, so I don't know how to <laughs> but, uh, but we really tried to, we really dealt with some very sophisticated intellectual constructs to come up with this notion of a, of a curriculum that was Afro-Brazilian, that dealt with narrative, dealt with voice, dealt with epistemological reflections, dealt with the idea of identity, all struggling with, these are my folk, that looks like Andy May over there. We see people looking like our folk yet, and so we talk about all that. Now let me reflect for the last minute or two that I, I want to talk with you about the introduction. And that is, the, the reflection is that the, 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 the Bantu Congo, and the, and the Congo is very deep, the Congo and Angola presence is really strong, still alive, moving every day on the streets in, 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 uh, in uh, Salvador. But the Bantu Congo say we have a, a knowing and knowable spirit. And when you think about that, it says that your spirit knows stuff that you intellectually don't know. And that part of our maturation is to know what our spirit knows. And I thought my, my deep insight of this process was to see a known and knowable spirit in action. Because folk, were, our spirits were talking to each other. On, I think, three levels. First level is that, and I think the, 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 the I guess we can call them fellows, no, maybe not, let's say the group. The group, well, uh, because they may not want to be known publicly as a Fulbright fellow, I don't know. <laughs> but the group, the group had a spirit talk with themselves. They were internally talking about and thinking about and reflecting about and, and, and going to be going to each other's place to live in and have a little drink and, and, uh, and uh, uh, what's that drink that you brought to my room? Shashay, 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 Whatever it was, they like it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was that was good. That was family. The family came together. We sat, we sat in the room and talked. Now I, I, I brought my own special ingredients, some fried up some chicken, because I think I got the thing in, in, in me. We're gonna, we're gonna have a, a chicken off in a moment. So he can not say, you don't know, you don't know. You know, it's adult supervision. Adult supervision here. We had an internal talk. I'm calling intra talk. And then there was a spirit talk that was between each other. And you saw it getting on the bus. You saw them talking. People were looking, have a nod and see the insight. That was the inter between each other, spirits talking to us, that we didn't have really the intellectual concept of work necessarily, but we were communi spirit was communicating all around us. And finally, there was a supra level, and that was that, that we were having our spirits talk to the divine. And that divine is seen throughout, uh, but here in many different ways. I mean, just walking the street, sometimes you're walking in a certain a certain terrarium, you can see the you know, trees move differently. See, I mean, I may have been <laughs> drinking with that shasha, I don't know. <laughs> but but, 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 the, but the, the fauna and the flora was talking to us. We was walking these different places. That was the spirit talk. And that's, that's just my reflection. Now, you all take it for what you want. But the experience in the condom blades and the experience in the terrariums allowed us, the group, to gain insight and understanding that we didn't come there with. It was in us but we hadn't been, it hadn't been brought out of us. That's what spirit talked to us. It's always in us, that's what brought out of us. And so there were two things that I think came out of this experience that I want to suggest as methodology. One was memory, and the other was imagination. And the memory was that we, 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 we had intercourse with materials. Uh, using our little Portuguese that we had together, we thought we could read the dictionary. We had, we had, we started dealing with with materials and writings and articles that we had that was available to us that wasn't available before we went to uh, Brazil. That's memory. Because memory really is when you read some historical document, it reminds you of what you did. It reminds you what you did. There's a problem here because sometimes the, the, the writers of that memory are not us. So they put their stuff on it. So you gotta then work through that. But memory is an important methodology. And I'm gonna say that the students in this in, in, in media, that you should use your memory mean to engage in the, the written material. The second part of that that, that came, came, came to me in, in, our, in our Brazil was imagination. And imagination is not just make up something. Imagination is to use your spirit to understand and to ponder what would it have been. And so when we look at Brazil, we look at the Afro-Brazilians and watch those people working, watch the 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 the, the, uh, the 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 practice of common play, you can have a imagination of what African spiritual systems and I 
and I, I'm very clear now that we should not be talking about these things as, as African religions. They are spiritual systems. They are spiritual science. You right there? Uh, they are spiritual science. And as we start having a discussion with our understanding of Condomble and Ifa and, 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 and the, what they call traditional African religions, no, they're spiritual science. And we need to understand them as a science. And what made me that most clear to that, thank you, what made okay, me most clear to that, and I'm going to stop with this, is that I had the distinct pleasure of sitting with a, a high priestess named Makota Valdez. And Makota is from the Angolan tradition of uh, Condomble. And this little lady, uh, this tall, is one of the most powerful women I've ever seen besides my own mother who was that tall. And, 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 but she sat with us and, and to show you how the African world is so linked together, we were talking to the group of her. And she mentioned, and some of you know, of Yafukiao. Yafukiao was a Congolese shaman, scholar, mystic who just passed. And in talking with her, she brought up Yafukiao's name. And, uh, and, and Vera had told her that when we last saw, when we last saw Fukiao, he said, if you're going to Brazil, make sure you see uh, what, he, what we thought he said was Virginia. So we run around looking for Virginia. Her name was Valdina. But, but uh, it's interesting, the spirits don't play with you. They don't make you get this. So it turned out she was on our itinerary. We met with her. And when Vera showed her, told her that Fukiao had asked us to meet with her, and Vera has a picture of when we saw Fukiao in the hospital, in the hospice, a picture of Fukiao. He she showed her in the picture. This small, wonderful, powerful woman looked, and in the deepness of her spirit, the tears just rolled down her eyes. Now she was not, I don't believe she was just crying because Fukiao had passed. Her spirit was crying because the knitting of the African family was so tight. And here we are. Here's Fukia, here's her. And she said Fuka had caused so, so many things. And so it's with that observation that I want to stop and suggest that we remember that we are, we are spirits of an annoying and knowable spirit. And our task is to know what our spirit knows. And Brazil, Africa in particular, is a good place, a good classroom to know what your spirit knows. So I'll stop and ask you. Linda, come on. Good morning again. Good morning. I forgot how to say that. Portuguese. Oh, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was the worst Portuguese student of all because I didn't get the benefit of the free lunch. Um, first, giving honor to the Creator and the ancestors upon whose shoulders we stand. Giving honor to each and every one of you. And I'm especially wanting to give honor this morning to the children for whom all of this is being prepared. And I have to give honor to my sister, girlfriend, student, Dr. Siri Briggs Brown. Amazing. just been an amazing experience, and um, I'm honored and humbled to have been a part of it. All the pieces just came together because we moved in an African way, and she moves in an African way, which has to do with being open to spirit. So starting with the theme, culture is power, to the focus on history, politics, and culture, uh, the African way emerges. As an advisor, I guess my own uh, thinking and orientation was to look at the African way from a specific tradition I call the wisdom tradition. The wisdom tradition of African deep thought that can be traced back to classical African civilization. Because if we can be or want to be truly comprehensive in our understanding of the African way, we can afford to go back to the beginning, the first historical record, and see how that moves forward to present day. And the beauty is it does move forward in present day. And going to Brazil, which has the largest African population you know outside of the continent, it was just amazing how it does move forward in a particular way. So in terms of the wisdom tradition of African deep thought, what I mean by that is um, 
going back to the sacred text where uh, I think they're dating at 2052 BC, the ancestors are talking about what it means to be wise. And they say, the wise is the one whose heart is informed about things we otherwise do not know. And they go on to delineate the specificity of what it means to be wise. And I guess one of the most important takeaways for me from this Brazilian experience is the impact of what we call menticide as black psychologists, but they more clearly focus on as epistemism. If you kill the people's way of knowing, and you kill the people's meaning of knowledge, you kill the people. Mm -hmm. Not different than what Woodson said. If you control the way people think, you control the people. So what we were given the opportunity to do in Brazil is see the ways in which we have overcome epistemicide. And there's certainly a lot more work to do, but I don't think this experience um, will be wasted because we are working, as, as they say, we're dancing as fast as we can. So the wise is the one whose heart is informed about things we otherwise do not know. I also focus on another sacred text, the pyramid text, that talks about the creation of Ra as Ta, which has to do with the creation of divine consciousness. As Bob Wade said earlier, we're coming from a wisdom tradition that has been taught and reinforced by some of the greatest thinkers. Taka Fukuyao was very clear. He said, in the band to Congo, we are living sons. And as Wade said, as living sons, then we have the opportunity and challenge of not only knowing, but the belief that the divine within us is knowable. That's a different episteme than we're socialized into. So one of the things that I was interested in trying to transmit to our teachers and our faculty is something about an African way based on this wisdom tradition. I think another key piece folding in um, very syntonically is the notion coming from our ancestors about their language. They called their language words of God, the Medjugorje, words of the divine. So if these early people thought whatever thought, whatever words came through their mind was a divine speaking, how do we get back to that? How do we get back to the place where I know the words coming from my mouth are from the divine? So we have a mighty charge here, but in Brazil, they just were laying it out in terms of how we can move that process. Um, one of our um, challenges that we as black psychologists have looked at is this notion of identity. And I was so pleased that one of our presenters at the, um, actually I think the second, uh, Humberto, Silvio, Silvio Humberto, talked about the need for a new identity. We need a new identity that's not race-bound, but consciousness-bound. And so we have, with an African way, come to be able to articulate something of what that new identity is and what it needs to be and what it needs to become. The um, other thing he stressed is the necessity for a new myth. Don't think he meant by myth. We tend to think of myth as something somebody made up sometime a long time ago. It's not really true. No. Myth is that imagination that way to Myth is, um, just as real as anything we think of as fact-based. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, what our ancestors understood and what we were trying to teach in terms of the African way is that we move to a new episteme that allows us to go within and connect with the divine and be led and moved in that way mm -hmm. such that whatever we produce, is consistent with a self-knowledge that is multidimensional. Self meaning connected to the ancestors, the yet unborn, all of nature, the entire community. So if I'm moving from that space, then I'm almost invariably going to produce that which our humanity needs. 
for survival, survival and sustenance. One of the points that um, the um, Maya made that Wade talked about is that the candomblé way is focused on being rather than having. Being rather than having. Clearly from the epistemology I just described, your focus has to be on being versus having. So how do we how do we teach in such a way that our being is being imparted to the students that ignites within them a being which is imparted. So we now begin to have a resilience, we begin to have an energy, we begin to have a vibration that isn't measurable necessarily by the typical things we like to measure in education that don't work for our children. From an African epistemology, we know by self-knowledge, this multidimensional self, and we know by vibration or rhythm and symbolic imagery. If we are all divine, all is divine, then it only makes sense that we're really, really, really interested in refining an awareness of the vibration. And it makes sense that all that is is simply representing the divine, a symbolic representation of the divine. So how do you teach that in 30 days or less? <laughs> when we're trying to learn Portuguese and we're trying to get a little samba in, <laughs> all of that. But the spirit is real, and the spirit is power. And so being then, so much was accomplished that we could not imagine. In terms of my own work, I had, you know, you're always aware of Brazil, and I'm always, but to have your focus and attention turn to Brazil, and that experience was just amazing. So a couple of things that, um, that, become a part of shaping this curriculum and education, as Wade pointed out, is what, what does it mean to be human? And when I see myself as a living son, as a divine being, and I see you that way, that love, that energy, that vibration, that peace, the well-being, begins to vibrate us all on a new level. How do we make sense of reality? We no longer necessarily look at what our five senses inform as giving power to what we see and what we hear. But rather we know what we see and what we hear has first been informed by what we think and what we feel and what we've spoken. So we shift. I think um, my beloved Baba says power is the ability to define reality and get others to respond to that definition yeah. as if it were their own. So we, we, we come then as educators to take our power back and we come to teach young people to take their power back and no longer give their power up readily to someone else's definition that is going to be destructive and then asylum. Once we can begin to absorb this other way of being. And it was so funny because as advisors, as co-advisors, the students picked up, well, by the way, it's kind of like this, and Mama Linda's kind of like that. And so we had this um, masculine feminine vibration going, which was invaluable because we all are what? Both. And to see it in action is very instructive, particularly in that kind of environment. One of the things that I want to leave you with, <coughs> having discussed this African way, is this notion of kilambismo. We had a wonderful retired professor, engineer, philosopher, who spoke with us. And he talked about the fact that we all are Colombo. As you know, Colombo is the communities created by Africans who fled and created their own land, their own space. 
and still to today have that land. They're still fighting to make sure they have control of that land. He said, you all are Colombo. And as you practice it, you are Quilombismo. We must become Quilombos. We must live Quilombismo if we're going to move in the direction that our ancestors will be pleased. And you have no choice. We have to educate our children in such a way that they understand who they really are and they understand what's really important. And the challenge is for us as educators is you can't teach something you don't know. So if you don't know this African way of thinking and being in the world, how are you going to teach? You're not. But it's OK, because what? It's a developmental process. And the nature of that developmental process is that you are constantly striving and developing and working. And as a consequence, we will succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you again uh, to our elders, and uh, hopefully you can hear just from those few minutes uh, how deep the conversation was and how deep the reflection was uh, with the teachings and the dialogue that we had with our advisors and elders and master teachers, Dr. Nobles and Dr. Linda James Myers. So uh, what we're going to do now is um, each of the participants, each of the faculty, the college, university, and high school faculty educators are going to come up and take about five minutes or so to talk about one of the units or lectures that they created as a result of this project. And I really cannot overemphasize uh, the level of dedication that each and every one of these educators committed to this project. Like I said earlier, this was work. It was not easy. It was struggle and all things that are good. You have got to go through struggle. Um, very few of us knew a lot about Brazil. Very few of us, only, only a few of us, knew uh, Portuguese at all. And so there was a lot to learn and take in, and then at the same time, develop something that shows you understand what you're presenting. So that process was very engaging, and as I've said before, the result of what was produced is, is brilliant. It's very brilliant. So the first uh, college faculty educator that I'd like to introduce to you, if you don't already know, is uh, Sister Nzinga Duga. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, I am thankful and completely grateful. I'm thankful for the divine clearly gave me a mission and a vision to do this work. I am grateful to my elders because part of it, um, doing this process, it is a, it's very transformational. And I'm thankful for them because there's a notion that I live, I live by, and that is, um, is it the right time? Is it the appropriate time? And is it the right thing to say? And our elders who are with us, always knew the right thing to say at the right time to affirm the work that we were doing. And so when I was in um, Brazil, I was overwhelmed by all the things that African people have done. And I was overwhelmed by the fact that the world didn't know this. And I remember we were um, at Ashe's house. No, we were at Siri's house. And we were looking over, we all stayed in wonderful apartments. We were looking over the water and we were taking pictures and the sun was going down and the sun had this glow on it that we were like, this is nothing but the divine. And as I was looking at that, I was, um, I was overwhelmed in that moment and, um, and Baba Wade came up to me and he affirmed that exactly what we were doing and me in particular is what I was supposed to be doing. And those affirmations that happened with Mama Vera and Mama Linda along the way became critical for us to do this work. So I'm thankful for the elders. And if we understand who the elders are and who they're supposed to be and honor that, everything is in its divine place. I'm thankful for my peers because we had a hell of a time. 
in multiple kinds of ways, learning to be our true African self and struggle through trying to be what, what um, Baba Way calls our most African self in an anti-African place. And we really have to struggle through our own internal stuff around, because sometimes we'd be tripping, right? <laughs> and, um, and sometimes we thought other people were tripping, but the love was, to me, was so high that you had to recenter yourself. So I'm thankful for my peers, because we struggled through what it meant to be excellent in a space that was truly African. And it, it was wonderful. I'm thankful for family, children, my partner, my sister, and all those people who affirmed us to do this work. I'm completely thankful for that. And finally, I'm thankful for the students, because we're going to practice on you all. <laughs> and so what I love about African people is that if you don't get it right, they will tell you in the moment. They're not going to wait till later. They're going to be looking at you like, mm, I, I, I don't get this. I don't understand this. And I actually love that in the moment because it allows for us to have greater understanding. So I want to share just those things of gratitude because I really, as you all can tell, I'm very um, emotional about this experience that changed my life. And so finally, I want to um, just share in my opening, and then I'm going to make it really short because we seriously we got five minutes and our time is up to six minutes. Um, and so I want to um, give honor to Dr. Brown and Dr. Thompson, who actually really did affirm us to do this work and said that very, well, very, very um, early on. And one of the things that Dr. Brown taught that I took away from this, and this is very true for all of you all who are teachers out there, is that teaching requires you to go to the place where African people are. And two, you can go where African people are and you're teaching African studies, your teaching is not complete. And African people are everywhere, but you've got to go abroad. And if Dr. Brown didn't teach anything else on this, we have to go where African people are to understand that stream of consciousness and to reconnect ourselves. So that's critical. And then finally, um, my Baudina, and my, for those of you who are not speaking Portuguese, it just means mother. And so my Baudina said something powerful for me that stayed in my heart and really frames what I'm trying to do. She said that, and I don't remember the question that she asked, you all may remember, um, but we were asking her, so something along, what do we do? You know, how do we move from here? And she said it may be up to us who have come to this understanding to actually have to go back and reteach Africa. And that was huge because those of us who have been to particular parts of Africa know the struggles that Africa has in terms of the colonization that they face and the things that they um, embrace that are not essentially African. It is yes. the colonized African. Yeah. And so that, that affirmed what I was doing. So I'll begin with um, how I came to my course, and, I, and I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. But as I was doing my study, uh, my focus became the history of slavery in the Americas, but with an emphasis on Brazil. But my theme around my course is something that I saw everywhere I've been where African people are. And what I found is when the European meets the African, that the African faces subjugation, coercion, appropriation, destroying and remaking. And this is like a global phenomenon, a global methodology of rupturing the spirit of those who they've captured. Yes. And so for me, my course had to be around that process that we find that is everywhere where Europeans meet African people. Yes. And so my course will focus on the enslavement of Africans in America, but with a special emphasis on Brazil, and looking at the destroying or the rupturing of those who are captured, and then how we actually are able to remake our spirit. And Brazil really um, helped us understand how they were able to preserve their spirit and how they were able to um, remake it. And so um, the course highlights the global 
but unique practice that Europeans had of enslaving Africans, and it is unique to African people because they attempted to enslave others, but it's, it's completely different because the desire was to, to destroy the African spirit, to remake the African mind, spirit, culture through the lens of what it means to be European, but European from a deficit perspective, one that would subjugate himself or herself to the European. And so it's going to look at this process as a transnational phenomenon. And so we'll do a brief comparison, a comparative analysis of African slavery in the United States and Brazil just to highlight and articulate that these practices are similar and they are global. And so one of the first things that the course highlights is the cultural dismemberment. And that is to try to remove the spiritual practices, and that's one thing that we learned. It's not a religion. It, it is a spiritual way of life, a spiritual way of being, and then trying to replace them with European religion. And we saw a lot of that um, in, in Brazil. It's everywhere. Um, it also will do a survey of the landscape, because when you're in Brazil, you can see the construction of a slave country. So everywhere we went, we saw where our ancestors had constructed a particular kind of, of land. And then I, I, in my um, um, course particularly looks at the case of Escrava Anastasia, where it was a, a, an enslaved African woman who they masked their face. And so all these things that they do that's really designed to break the spirit, and as Mama Linda talked about, um, to to um, to actually, it's a process of trying of mental suicide, and so it, it, we will look at particular cases. Number three, look at the social scientific racism because it's the same whether it's in the United States or Brazil, where social science is used as a process for defining the African psyche and the, the spirit. And so you have multiple ways in which social sciences tries to make the African less than he or she is, and then to make that social science policy, right? And then third, the social practices. Saw a lot of blackface in Brazil. And I was really troubled by the blackface because it's prominent in all the shops. And all the faces are very dark and red lipstick, but most of the, the women are the blackface. And so that distorted imagery becomes important. Then there's a process of embrachiamento where they said, well, okay, if we cannot, um, if we cannot break your spirit, we're just going to try to remove the African from you. And so there was a real process of attempting to whiten um, black folks, but I guess they didn't understand that African gene because that berry just doesn't whiten that easy. And so there was a desire to 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 mix the races, and it was a policy in order to make less of an African. We just got more Africans, unfortunately. And then we learned a lot of the proverbial tradition and wisdom that we also find in the United States. And so um, my course looks at some of the, that wisdom. And then finally, we have to speak to what are the resistance practices that Africans utilize to ensure that our spirit was not broken because if we didn't find anything else through the, through the women, through the Mayis, through the priestesses, that the spirit was not broken and that there are particular resistant practices that ensured that the African spirit is, uh, was not broken. And those resistant practices are the ones that we have to use actually to do exactly what Maya Gardena said, is to reteach, relearn, and re-become who, um, who we believe we should be. And that's the, those are the um, underpinnings of my course. Yeah.